So here we are talking about coaching and psychedelics. It is my uh, particular pleasure today to talk to Diane Adamson. Uh, Diane, hi, welcome to the podcast. Hi, Yannick. Welcome. Or thank you so much. It's great to be here. <laughs> it's great to have you. It's been a long time coming. I've been excited about this particular conversation um, because you're one of the few training providers in the coaching and psychedelics field. And uh, that alone is already a reason to dig into this a little bit and explore your perspective. Um, I've got some particular questions around that. We've got a lot of kind of general questions. Uh, as always, we want to explore different perspectives on, on coaching and psychedelics. And you already mentioned that your perspective is probably quite different to a lot of other people's perspective in the coaching industry. So uh, that, again, makes me particularly uh, excited to what's to come. So uh, quick shout out uh, to my co-host, Julia. This was supposed to be our first episode together, uh, but she got caught up traveling and uh, just didn't make it in time. And uh, since uh, it took us a little bit of time to get this in the calendar, we decided, let's just go ahead, explore this anyway. And now the end, you're, uh, you're quite busy with what you're doing it being true to you. And uh, you're also a rare guest on podcasts, I've just learned. So I feel especially honored. Plus, it's your birthday. So thanking you so much for taking the time on this rather special day to have this conversation. Well, thank you so much, Yannick. It's great to be here. It's great you have a podcast specific to coaching and psychedelics, which is why I thought, gosh, I should definitely go on this one. And I see that you're interviewing a lot of other people that I know in the field. So it's a pleasure to be here and excited to unpack some of uh, the topics today. Fantastic. Um, and one just a quick shout out to uh, Marge. Marjorie uh, is helping us with operations on the podcast. She recently joined the team and she's just doing so fantastic work. I, I wanted to give her a public shout out. Uh, if you are listening to this episode because you found it um, through some snippet of ours that we put out there, that's probably Marge's doing. So uh, she's amazing. Thank you so much, Marge, for being on board and helping us to have a broader conversation. But without further ado, uh, let's jump into things. Um, usually we ask in some way or another, Diane, uh, who are you? And that's a complex question. Maybe we start with something like uh, you're sitting at a dinner party or at a networking event or something like that. Somebody asks, hey, so what do you do? How do you answer that? Uh, well, yes, great question. Um, well, I'm Deanne Adamson. I'm from Southwest United States. I come from a good traditional family and upbringing and definitely got a little bit taken by mainstream culture throughout my youth and my young adulthood, I would say, which took me down a lot of wrong turns and probably added a lot of karma to my journey. But eventually, I've kind of come back full circle to my to my roots, my traditional roots, and the, the wisdom of my own family system, and had that existential conversation about what is life? What is the human experience? What are we here for? I was always very curious in the purpose of life. And I wanted to, at the end of my life, be able to look back and say, wow, I did right, or I did good by my life. And I didn't want to give in to a lot of the modern teachings that sort of water down the path of spiritual cultivation. So, I've had quite a journey. I've definitely made a lot of mistakes, but through that process of returning to the path of my true self, I've become very inspired, not only by my own journey, but my journey to help other people do the same. I think we live in a lost and sometimes upside down world where people don't know up from down and, and good from um, bad anymore. So, I have, through that process, created a, a, a mission of my own that is taken place in the form of business and entrepreneurship. Starting a company about 12 years ago called Being True to You. I started in 2010. And that's where most of my life is now dedicated to is 
this company. I've started another company as well that I'll talk about maybe on future podcasts that's dedicated to veterans and first responders doing the same kind of work. But what we offer is transformational recovery coaching which is a sector of coaching. As we know, there's a lot of different types of coaching, as I'm sure you've explored. And we do transformational recovery coaching, which also blends into psychedelic integration coaching because that just happens to be such a trend in society today that people are turning to psychedelic therapies to engage the transformational work. And there's such a crossover there. So um, that's a little bit about me, you know, just a very um, spiritual person, a person that has sought out truth wherever I could and created a company to help other people find the path of their true self, but in a very neutral way. I love that. Um I, I had a quick look, um, well, not so quick look, actually, uh, at your website. And in the About section, you write quite a compelling story of what led you to um, recovery coaching, to uh, how psychedelics came into that. Um, but I wanted to give our, our listeners maybe uh, a chance to get a, get a glimpse of that story. What led you to um, recovery coaching? Um, transform uh, transformational recovery coaching and how do how did psychedelics come into the mix of that? Yeah, well, you know, there's a lot of different factors. That's how you know a career really develops. Is there's so many different stepping stones that get you there. So I would say some pivotal things in my journey would be my own sobriety from alcohol, which also took place in 2010. I had a sudden conversion experience. I never thought about giving up alcohol. It was a big part of the culture, the social culture that I was in. And having a drink or many drinks mm. was just a part of the way that I saw my life and in my value mm. system. And for me, it was more about moderation than it ever was quitting. And there was this summer in 2010, when I just had a major conversion experience where in one moment, um, feeling just sheer despair in the pit of my stomach, I thought to myself, like, I just, I don't know how I can help people with addiction. You know, there was people around me that were struggling significantly and their life was on the line. And I just thought people are dying of this. Like people literally mm -hmm. cannot give this up. And so, but there's nothing I could do. And this voice came in my head and said, there is something you can do. You can quit drinking yourself. And I knew in that moment that I had an out. Like if I were to say yes and take an oath right there in that moment and say yes to giving up alcohol forever, that I would never want it or never crave it again. And somehow I just knew that. And after 14 years of drinking wow. in my entire life, I was still working in hospitality and fine dining. I was serving wine. You know, it was a family tradition. It was a social tradition. I just said yes. I said yes to that voice. And that really changed my life. But little did I know, you know, in starting this coaching business that I would get into Ibogaine integration coaching. And so it was just a few months later that I met a provider in the Ibogaine industry who was treating people with opiate and heroin addiction and come to find out many different types of addiction. And so I visited those centers in Baja, Mexico, and I was just amazed. I couldn't believe what I had seen. You know, I had started using psychedelics when I was a teenager and a young adult, like many people, but they were recreational experiences. And although they really pulled the veil back for me and helped me to look within and just discover the multidimensional nature of our reality and the sort of spiritual realm around our human experience, and just looking at all the different things within my own psyche. I mean, there's a lot of benefits, but I didn't really attribute it to healing and growth back then. I really just thought about them as recreational experiences. So when I discovered Ibogaine and I saw what was happening, I just couldn't believe it. I mean, you're taking people who have been addicted, physically dependent to opiates and other things. And through one journey, they're coming out the other side. And not only did these clients not have cravings and not have withdrawal, which is amazing in and of itself, but they had a restored purpose for and, and hope for living. And 
So I wanted to examine that. I was very curious because, you know, coming from an academic background, working in the judicial field, um, working in mental health care as a counselor, and I worked in um, the judicial realm as well as a victim advocate. You know, I thought, wow, this is this is so interesting. You know, this experience really blows the lid on a lot of the conventional approaches to recovery. So, I then dedicated my my life and my company to understanding this transformational process. Because on the one hand, I myself had a conversion experience that is unexplainable, where people are spending, you know. Um, every dollar they have and many trips back and forth to treatment and months and years in meetings to let go of just one attachment. I had this conversion experience that just happened like that. I wanted to understand that. And then I saw Ibogaine and I saw that this entheogenic experience, very powerful entheogenic experience, was also creating this experience of a sudden conversion whereby a person could eliminate the biggest desire and attachment in their life and restore a sense of self and a sense of hope and purpose in their life. So, I would say yeah. those two things and just really falling in love with the work. I mean, I just couldn't believe it. These people I had met that had burned every bridge in their life. Um, most people had given up on them. When I talked to them, I was just like, I could see their soul. I could see their true self. I could, mm -hmm. I, I believed in them. Mm -hmm. And, and, and so did the medicine. And so through that, I thought, wow. Then I started to study the phenomenon of addiction in and of itself, not from an academic or scientific perspective at all, but actually from a spiritual perspective. I just started to look at the phenomenon through my own eyes, through my own experiences of addiction, through observing addiction and the phenomenon and how it plays a role in our human experience in general. And I thought, well, gosh, this is not the compartmentalized disorder that we make it out to be. This is actually a condition of the human experience at large that actually is a delusion, an illusion. It pulls people from their true self, convinces people that the answers are outside, that there's an external um, fix of some kind that can fulfill someone within and it's and it's a lie and in that lie a person moves further and further away from themselves however through that process of losing yourself you have to cultivate yourself to survive you know so it creates a mm -hmm. life and death scenario essentially whereby a person has to do the work to get out and i found that so fascinating that mm -hmm. that the soul would put these conditions on a person that in order to save yourself, you have to do the work. You can't just walk out of this. And there is no set solution. Like there's no solution that's going to work for everyone. Mm -hmm. A person has to do the work. So that's really, you know, where mm -hmm. coaching and psychedelics and my path um, inter interwove. Wow. Okay, so quite a multidimensional spiritual phenomenological uh, stance on addiction, where it seems that the recovery, the transfer, you say, you call it transformational recovery work, and that from your own perspective, and also given the ibogaine experience, or often generally the the psychedelic experience, other psychedelics have that as well. There seems to be this this moment, this powerful shift in perspective, in philosophy or psychology, something shifts so significantly that it's it's maybe not impossible to go back, but that we create an opening for somebody to not go back to that anymore. Does that capture it? So say that again, Yannick, you're saying that like when we have that sudden conversion, like something shifts and changes so that that reality almost doesn't exist for a person anymore. It's just like you're in a new state of being. Yeah. So if I send it correct, that you had that powerful moment, that shift, that transform, that transformation, as I understand it, is this um, the shift in mindset. As something shifts so significantly that that creates an opening to move away from the addiction and not being so powerfully drawn, or even some people don't think about reusing anymore. I just wanted to uh, get a sense, get a sense for that understanding of addiction and where the coaching work starts to tap into that. Mm -hmm. 
It depends how you look at it. I mean, addiction is such a holistic, Mm -hmm. you know, phenomenon. I mean, it affects people on a mental, emotional, spiritual, lifestyle, social level. So I would say it's mostly a spiritual thing. And I would say in that experience that I had of what I believe, you know, our creator talking directly to me and the experience that people are having through these powerful entheogenic experiences is some sort of release of a inner spirit, a dark spirit that has you know, taken over the body. So, this would be in contrast to the popular academic and scientific perspectives of addiction. But from my perspective, and in talking to thousands of people through heroin addiction and other types of addiction, they will tell you something took over my body. There's a foreign entity in my body. There's demons in my body. The devil took over my body. Um, And when presented with the opportunity, whether it is a, you know, spiritual encounter directly with our creator, or whether it is these powerful entheogenic medicines that seem to have some kind of ability to exorcise things out of a person, it's like there is now, it's it's not just an opening, it's like there has been a release of something from the body. So, to me, you are moving into a new state of being a truer state of being, which makes it easier to develop agency in your life and to take control of your own consciousness and your own behaviors. So, that is how I see it through my own perspectives and my understanding of it. And, you know, through the psychedelic journeys, like this is kind of what people are describing when they come out of their experiences. You know, people can see these things being eliminated, whether they're purging and they can see spirits like actually coming out of their mouth or whether they can see it being pulled out of their bodies. And sometimes in these experiences, you know, when you're sitting for people, you'll see that they're actually pulling something out of their mouth is very common. And so, I would say that there is something that dissolves or dissipates from the body from a spiritual level, which then allows the you know mental and emotional and social and lifestyle and environmental factors to fall into place after that which is really the integration aspect of addiction because you can eliminate the root of something but then there's the pattern and the pattern is what you're you're working on in coaching in the integration phase especially after something like ibogaine you know people come out they're not going to have physical cravings and physical desires or withdrawal symptoms for opiates 95 you know percent of the time it's a little bit harder with people that have been on suboxone and methadone for a long time but in general you know these experiences aren't going to happen but that doesn't mean the memory is gone that doesn't mean the pattern the, the habitual pattern. Still there. yeah yeah so that's a lot of what coaching is is like okay something has shifted and changed. And however people think of that, now how do we um, integrate those changes mentally and from a physical standpoint in your life? And that's really what we're doing in, in the integration coaching realm following these psychedelic experiences is taking advantage of those windows of opportunity. Because regardless of the plant medicine that people are using or the synthetic medicine that people are using, Um, And regardless of whether or not they were working on, you know, big addictions, small addictions, or other states of suffering or of some kind, there's still going to be that process of change from a habitual standpoint. And that's why coaching just comes into play so well. Yeah, and I think this is where often people misunderstand where what is therapy and what is coaching, because often therapy goes deep into the psyche and tries to create these kind of spiritual shifts or mindset shifts or shifts in personal philosophy. Uh, where coaching takes starts when we work with those patterns once these uh, these experiences have taken place. Um, I'm saying that, and also there's a question in there, I guess, in terms of. Does the coaching start? I mean, that transformational recovery coaching that you're talking about, does that start after the experience or is there a preparation journey involved that's kind of makes it more likely that these experiences are taking place for people? Well, it's, it's, it's really important, especially if you're working through something, you know, so extravagant, like a chronic addiction or some kind of life debilitating 
chronic situation that you start in the preparation phase of things. So that's what I discovered. You know, we were doing aftercare for Ibogaine and it was going so well. But then we started to get some clients that were like, hey, you know, I, I have a journey planned in two months, but can I start the coaching? And then I saw so clearly that preparation is where integration should actually begin because after the experience, the ego tends to make up its mind of of how well the experience works. So the ego will come out and be like, oh my gosh, it fixed everything. And they're on that pink cloud and I don't need to do any integration. Like everything is fixed. I'm better. I'm whole and I can return to my life. And they might skip over, you know, very important processes with integration because of the lack of understanding beforehand, the stage had not been set or somebody comes out and says, it didn't work. I didn't get what I what I wanted or what I had hoped for. So I'm just going to return to life as normal and check this off as another thing. It didn't work. So it's very important through these experiences, whether whatever reasons a person is doing psychedelic therapies to start the integration in the preparation phase. Because in the preparation phase, you are, first of all, you're authenticating the experience for yourself. You know, you're doing the research, you're understanding what is the significance of this experience in my life? What are my intentions? And what is going to be my role in this process if I want to get results? Because it's not just something that does it for you. You have to show up and work in partnership with the medicine. And then also, you know, you want to do your due diligence and orient to the medicine that you're doing. Different psychedelics have a different profile to them. They they work in different ways, whether it's, you know, the, the length of time that you're in there or the type of material that you can work on. And so you want to orient to the medicine. You want to do your due diligence on the psychedelic itself, on the facilitators, on the retreat program. And then you want to understand like how to best prepare, whether it's, you know, nutritionally, like is there certain dieta to follow or is there a certain, you know, rituals uh, that can prep the consciousness and and the body to open up to the work. And then you're just setting the stage for the work. I mean, really, when people are brand new to personal development and self-improvement, whatever you want to call it, a lot of times people don't understand the work. And I've asked a lot of times, you know, what's the work to you? And people will say, we'll go into meetings or going to counseling or, or going, you know, here or there. They'll say something very you know, physical and not understanding, no, what's the inner work? Like, what does that actually mean? And so we found through preparation coaching to help people identify that voice that's playing inside of their head, the fears that are coming up, the resistance, the particular, you know, limiting or just false beliefs and um, how a person's mind actually relates to their habits and their character and their interactions in life, like how everything's connected. And so once a person kind of turns that that awareness on, that you start to develop self-awareness and a deeper self-understanding. So then when you get to the retreat and you enter into the medicine, it's like, aha, like I can identify my work when it shows up because I've already been practicing this. In the reverse, if someone doesn't have preparation, Yannick, and something comes up, they're more likely to project. So let's say a fear comes up and anger follows it, and then someone over here did something that's that's irritating, it's easy to say, well, they're interrupting my journey and I'm angry. So therefore, you know, I'm not getting the experience that I wanted when really no, that's supposed to happen. That person was supposed to irritate you. You're, the fear is supposed to be servicing. You're supposed to look at your anger because you have a lot of anger in life and it's actually inhibiting your ability to achieve the goals you want to achieve because of this you know, unresolved emotion underneath. Yeah. So in that situation, the person will say, aha, thank you for irritating me in their heart. You know, Thank you for irritating me because mm-hmm. now I actually, I can work with this and I can use this. So the preparation to me is really essential. It's, mm-hmm. and I'll just say this, it's very challenging after the experience to go find an integration coach or a therapist because then you have to go through the history of who you are, why you yeah. did the medicines, what your goals are. And by the time you get through all of that, it's like, it's already taken away from yeah. the integration opportunities from the, the experience. Yeah, yeah, because ideally you want to start the integration work already uh, within a strong relationship of confidence, trust, and having a human-to-human relationship that creates a, a good space uh, to, to dive into that kind of work. 
Yeah, I, I like a lot of what you're saying. Um, you mentioned psychedelic therapies. Um, would you consider coaching to be a psychedelic therapy? I had that conversation somewhere else. I just wanted to to be curious about that. Uh, also in the face of what you just said in terms of you starting to work with somebody who's often suffered for a very long time and had very strong urges, can be very, very low points in their lives. So uh, somebody who might come in and say, But hey, isn't addiction somebody that coaches shouldn't touch with a barge pole? You're already going into uh, their psyche quite deeply. Sometimes you work with habits. Sometimes you're just exploring something. But, you know, as the line between coaching and therapy can be a very blurry one at best, particularly when it comes to helping people with their recovery. Uh, I just wonder what your thoughts were. What would you, um, what would you uh, respond to somebody like that? And we, no, we, we had that conversation as well. I'm, I'm quite critical of coaching as a healing modality. So I guess that's why I'm particularly um, um, curious about that, that conversation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so a few things to unpack there. So, I mean... First of all, we could just separate, you know, coaching from therapy. So, I mean, coaches are going to help somebody develop and transform themselves and to achieve goals and to reach greater heights and to just cultivate like greater states of influence in their life to increase their capacity to experience more. So with coaching, I would say it's a very active process. It's a process of helping people to achieve their goals on a more superficial level. And it's also a, um, an invitation to have the existential conversation about what this life is about and how I want to show up for myself or oneself in this life. And so it's a very present conversation that's looking into the future, I would say. And then with therapy, I would say therapists are more trying to understand or helping clients and, or patients to better understand themselves and their pathologies and looking to improve conditions of mental and emotional health. So they're similar in the fact that in both, you have talk sessions, you're building trust and rapport. It both requires training, professionalism, and supporting ethics. In both situations, the clients are asked to do their personal work. Both happen through a series of talks. And, you know, both are respectable models of helping each other, but they're different in how they show up in terms of the school of thought, the framework, and the modalities used. And then just the format and the style. So um, that's one thing to clarify that, yeah, there's some similarities between all helping professions and therapists. And then there's some differences. Now with coaches, um, you're helping a person to work on the best version of themselves. I mean, that's really the goal with us when we're doing transformational coaching. With coaching, you are not treating diagnosable conditions or pathologies. You know, you are not focused on mental health and emotional health from a medical perspective. Right. But that but being I, said... Sorry, could I jump in there quickly? Because you, yeah. the way you described addiction, I think this makes sense to me now, is that addiction doesn't seem to be a, a pathology or a physical issue. It's a, It seems to be a spiritual or a systemic uh, challenge for people that hence... Probably it just seems to not fall into the therapy sector because of that, mm -hmm. or not necessarily at least. Yeah, so I mean, you can just look at so what we do is Yannick is we look at states of suffering. So we're not looking at these from a pathological perspective, we're not looking at it like a therapist is going to look at a certain set of traits as pathological or abnormal. And then the goal is to actually work with that person to stabilize and find balance to those pathological traits and ideally start to normalize, you know, some of those traits. Whereas with a coach, we're not looking at these states of suffering as a pathology. We're looking at it as the human condition. Like this just is as a As a human being in this planet, going through the human journey, it's like these things come up, but we don't look at it as abnormal. We just look at it as this is what it is, and then we work with those different states. So, it's really important to understand as a coach that you're not working with these diagnosable conditions. You're not working with psychiatric conditions. You're not looking at 
pathologies at all, essentially. You know, a counselor is going to diagnose these conditions, and then they're going to write, <coughs> excuse me, treatment plans for those conditions using um, academic psychotherapies, specific academic psychotherapies in those treatment plans to help bring those pathologies to a place of stability and balance. In coaching, you're just not using any of that paradigm whatsoever. It's just a completely different paradigm. You're in a paradigm that says, okay, we're throwing all of that over to the medical professionals. So people who want to work on their diagnosable conditions, be it depression, generalized anxiety disorder, bipolar, eating disorders, um, and certain chronic addictions, you know, they'll go to medical professionals to work on those diagnosable conditions and follow a treatment plan. So the word treatment plan, the word diagnosis, the word professional evaluations, mm -hmm. all of these are medical terms. And this is a medical process that, you know, medical professionals should deal with. But in coaching, we do not screen out people who happen to have or have had in the past these diagnosable conditions because one that would cut out most of the population you know most of the population we would say nope you don't get a coach because at one time you had a suicidal thought or you've been diagnosed as depression or anxiety or insomnia or chronic pain or something like that like literally that would cut out most of the people using psychedelics right now and so we are not screening people out for these things it doesn't matter um, what they're presenting as long as they are coachable. So if they are coachable, they can have the conversation, they can get on the phone and they can say, I have you know, a problem or I have a goal and this is what I want to work on. And they are able to look within and take responsibility in those arenas, not working on, again, the pathologies or the psychiatric issues, working on the human condition itself, working on one's you know, mind, body and spiritual um, health and wellness in and of itself. And we can do that. What's right. important here, Yannick, is that coaches are very clear in their disclaimers of like, look, I'm not a medical professional. I'm a coach. Um, you mentioned in your intake form that you have this or that. So I just want to be clear. I can help you as a coach on, on your goals and some of these needs and preparing for these psychedelic experiences and integrating afterward. But if you want to work on, you know, X, Y, Z things, you know, it's important important that you work with a professional psychiatrist or psychologist or a doctor, physician, something like this. And also the coach needs to get really honest with themselves and make sure that them signing a coaching agreement is not going to take them away from a service that is more specialized that could help them more. So in, in the case of a lot of our clients, they'll have a therapist and a coach or they have their, you know, their physician and a coach. And in some cases they'll say, I've worked with all these medical professionals. I get it. I understand. I hear your disclaimer. I want to work with a coach right now. And I understand. And that's in signed contract. So as coaches, you know, participating in this transformational recovery process with our clients, we are not going into those, you know, psychiatric domains. It's really right. just a paradigm. And it's a different way of looking at the human psychology and, and human experience and it's a different way of treating it all together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I really hear you. Um, could you give us an example maybe from perhaps either your practice or maybe somebody you've supervised where uh, there was a referral, where there was a limit or a boundary to what a coach could do was reached and either that particular conversation was referred out to a therapist or maybe even the coaching work stopped and the person then went on to work with a therapist. Just trying to grasp uh, in more practical terms where where, where that line might be. And I appreciate this could be a really very much a case by case basis, but maybe something that uh, exemplifies the point. Yeah, I mean, a situation where somebody's actively harming themselves, like we had a girl once that went through the Ibogaine experience, and we had just met her, I think we did a couple prep sessions with her. And then she went home and we were working with her, but she was actively cutting herself on the phone. And, and interestingly enough, her coach was a former police officer and ended up calling 911 in her zip code. And um, she was very grateful for that. And the family was very grateful and they got like emergency you know, support on site. And so in that situation, we weren't able to support her because you know we are on the phone 
and she was physically, you know, harming herself. And although it was a common thing, you know, she really needed to be in a treatment center. And so we were able to be that liaison to get the emergency support. I don't think that she would have told anyone else. She really trusted her coach and wanted to, to work with them. But, you know, we were able to help that transition and get her into a treatment program where she could work with someone in person. So when somebody is in a state where they are um, planning to hurt themselves or they currently are hurting themselves, I mean, this is definitely need for in-person support. Um, There's been other situations of uh, just... Well, extreme personality disorders can be a little bit challenging as well, because in these situations, the inability to look within and take responsibility for oneself sort of cancels out the ability to work with a coach. And we have had some very powerful um, experiences helping people in this arena, but we've also had some challenges where Mm -hmm. it's best that they're working with a counselor face to face and and maybe working with a support group face to face in these situations because it's very delicate it takes a lot of mm. nourishment and it's hard to build trust and rapport with somebody in this state they might have superficial trust and rapport and then one day it just kind of blows up on the coach because the mm-hmm. kind of project and blame is intense so there have been situations around you know what you would call conventionally, you know, personality disorders that have been really extreme. And there's also been, you know, cases of depression too, where somebody is just unmoved. They are really so deep in their depression that they call them treatment resistant. And, you know, I kind of feel that a lot of the treatment resistant people fall into the hands of psychedelic providers somewhere around the world because they just want something new and different, you know, and we want to be able to help people in these situations, but we have seen such chronic states of depression whereby a client will not budge. They will not smile. They will not do the work. They just can't. And so in in situations like this, you know, where it's more extreme and a person cannot participate in their own self-introspection and their own, you know, um, take accountability for their own changes in their life. You know, it's like, we, we can't help So in those situations, we talk about this a lot within our mentoring group as coaches, you know, what makes for a good client, what makes for an effective coaching relationship, and when are there situations where we need to refer out? And we do, we refer out verbally and we refer out in writing so that a person will follow through and get the support that they need in areas that we help them. Yeah, you, you use the word delicate, and I think that fits it quite well because it's it's delicate. It's a it can be a really sensitive space to enter, and it to me it, it feels quite bold as a coach to take on a client that might be well when they reach out to you and want to prepare for this journey, but then maybe the next day or the next week or the next three months or the next year being in a really really dark place of mind, and when they're cutting themselves on the phone while they're with you on the phone, I think that's a very clear example of what needs to be done. But it can be really difficult to tell when the threshold is overstepped. Somebody might be quite manipulative or might be quite well to play a role. And um, I think it depends. Like I always thought it takes a lot of training to recognize at what point um, the work becomes bold and might be putting something at risk. Uh, But it's difficult to tell, right? And I, I guess that's the reason why I've been critical to put coaches in this position, um, recognizing all the beautiful work they can be doing, especially when they work in parallel. But it it feels bold to as a coach to put yourself into that position, working with very complex uh, people and very complex circumstances where it's not just addiction. Addiction often or usually is related or it comes in combination with a lot of other uh, challenging environments or challenging circumstances, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, with addiction, it's not that hard to work with. Most people are that come into psychedelics and come into coaching are honest with themselves about addiction. And so working with people through addiction as a coach is actually really fitting. But when you speak of healing, I also want to differentiate, you know, healers 
from both therapists and coaches, because really when you're in a position of being a healer, you are helping to heal another person. And with coaching, it's actually exactly the opposite. With coaching, you're helping people to do the work for themselves and you're holding them accountable to have the conversations they need to have with themselves to have those growth moments and holding them accountable to do the things that they themselves have determined to be helpful on their journey. You're not doing any kind of healing for them. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so we, uh, when I say healing, it's the um, intention of the coaching is to heal the person, help mm. the person heal or facilitate the healing, or sometimes even healing the person actively, depending on what the coach's philosophy and approach is. So it's, it's about, treating, fixing, healing. It's about moving against something. But when I hear you speak about it, it seems a, a growth uh, process rather than uh, fixing a pathology. And so I, I really appreciate that perspective uh, per se. Yeah, and it's definitely a, a, a challenging, touchy area because people are using psychedelic therapies to heal their own conditions and then working with a coach, right? So hmm. there's definitely a, a very close line there that a coach needs to be well-trained and well-informed on how to stay in that zone of coaching, which is really just the conversational pieces of it mm -hmm. because through psychedelic therapies, I mean, people are healing themselves of these pathologies and they mm -hmm. do want to talk to their coach about it. So it's a very relevant yeah. discussion that you bring up. Um, that it's perfect entry into the uh, conversation I wanted to have with you in terms of what kind of training does a coach need in order to engage with that in a safe, ethical way. And the perfect person to talk to you, uh, to talk to about uh, is you, because being true to you has been offering training in uh, psychedelic integration for many, many years. So but it might also be an, an opportunity to talk about what are you teaching people? What does a coach need in order to hold that space and help somebody uh, Uh, grow grow through that journey. Mm -hmm. Yeah, happy to weigh in on this. We started in 2013 doing our coach training program, which is now a 30-level coach training program over five and a half months, all online, about you know 10 to 12 hours a week with additional opportunities to dive in. So we have created quite a profound, comprehensive an in-depth coach training program for addiction recovery and psychedelic integration work, which is such an honor. I mean, in 2013, I was hiring other coaches and other counselors to help work with all the patients that were coming through the Ibogaine clinics. And they were just like, we don't know what to do. And I was like, yeah, you do your counselors, you know, you're, you're my, you're senior to me, like, you know what to do. And they're like, no, we don't, we don't get it. We don't understand. So, you know, I really had to go to the drawing board and think, gosh, you know, who am I to create a training program? But I did. I put together a 12-level training program back then, and now we're in the, the fifth edition, and now I'm working on the sixth edition for veterans and first responders, as I mentioned. And so, we've learned a lot because we've trained coaches and professionals and social workers and, I mean, people from universities, professors. I mean, it's just really amazing all the people that have come through and held us to a very high standard and really drilled us on what we're doing, which has made us really step it up. So we have a really good training program now. We're actually starting our next training program March 9th. Uh, so anybody that's interested, you know, go to beingtrudeo.com. We're happy to chat with you about this. I put the link um, in the description as well. Fantastic. So the first thing to becoming a coach is really doing your own work. I mean, I, I think if you're going to be in the transformational space, helping people go through their own transformation, you know, the first thing is really walking your own journey, looking within, identifying your own shortcomings, your own attachments, your own addictions. A lot of times we don't notice them because they just blend in so well with our, with our social reality. And just looking at how can I become more of an authentic person? How can I be more in integrity with myself? How can I improve my, my mental and emotional, physical and spiritual well-being? How can I stabilize and improve my relationships, my financial situation? Of course, it's a journey, but that journey is really the core of what it means to be a good coach, is to be in that process. And it doesn't mean you have to be at a place of perfection to start coaching. It just means that you have transformed some of your heavier things that are inhibiting you to step into any kind of profession, really, and that you're staying in that process of learning and growth and continuing to look within, 
to own your own stuff and to make it right. So that's like the first thing I would say, you know, on the journey of becoming a coach. And then on top of that is real life experiences, you know, whether you you want to create good social connections and and have a community and a network where you are helping people. So whether that's through volunteer work, whether that's through, you know, any number of job opportunities really will work. I mean, I used to work in restaurants and I was a server in a fine dining restaurant. And I once I made a list of the amount of skills that you can practice while working as a server. And I was like, wow, social skills, communication skills, problem solving skills, conflict resolution, um, financial skills, time management, multitasking. I mean, I just goes on and on and on. And, you know, that's just, you know, an, an average job in society that you can learn and grow and develop through your interactions with human beings. And you can really use every interaction with other human beings as a measuring stick for how well you're going to do as a coach. So I think in addition to doing your own journey and being on your journey is how can you get those real life experiences, being around people, helping to guide people, listening to people, identifying what is it that this person or this group of people really needs? What what are they communicating underneath, empathizing with them? You know, all of these kinds of real life experiences, no matter what domain you're currently in, you can be practicing these things is going to help on that path to becoming a good coach. Because I can tell you on all of the people we've trained that character is most important. It's not credentials. It's character is first and foremost. To make it as a coach, you have to be able to relate to your clients, to build trust and rapport with your clients, and to be able to communicate effectively with them and be able to put your heart first, which means that your heart is unblocked. You're not full of resentments and attachments that inhibit you from connecting and loving another human being and and without judgment, you know, so these real life experiences, I just can't say enough about it. And then, you know, you can, you can start the professional track and, and to start the professional track. Some people have gone the academic route. They become social workers or counselors or something alike. Some people have gone volunteer route, worked nonprofits, worked in, you know, different family and child centers, like helping people in this regard, Some people have gone the recovery route and taken like peer support and sponsorship, and they've gone down that path and and really practiced and honed in their skills of helping, you know, another human being through their process. And so all of these are going to set the stage for coaching. And then if you want specific training as a coach, there's a lot of books out there that are about coaching. And I like the coaching books. I think the coaching books are very neutral. I don't think they tie in a bunch of um, other kinds of doctrine into them. I think coaching is just very clean and um, neutral and universal for people. So there's a lot of good coaching books out there. There's seminars that people are putting on regarding coaching. So you can look into some of those. And then, of course, you can look around for a coach certification program that fits the niche that you want to do. And I do think it is helpful to find that niche. There's a lot of different types of coaching, and that's a whole process that we take our coaches through to find what you know, what realm you would coach best in. And then you find, you know, a certification program that really fits your interest. And so you don't have to get certified as a coach. I do not have a life coaching certification. I, you know, learned how to coach through personal experience. I have a background in counseling, I have a background in judicial victim advocacy, background in the nonprofits, um, kind of all the things I just spoke about, you know, reading as many books on personal development as I could. And so, you know, I, I have all of these tracks that I've taken, but when it came to coaching, I mean, I really created a new foundation because it was, you know, addiction recovery coaching and psychedelic integration coaching, and it was rather unique. But I think over the years, we've really come to a solid understanding of what coaching is. So, you know, our training program is an option and there's other training programs out there. And then the last thing I'll say, when you take that coach training program to become a coach, it's really about applying what you're learning, practicing and integrating. So you, you can't 
necessarily just go out and get the academic training and call it good. You know, you really have to be yeah. in some kind of, you know, working environment where you're working with humans, practicing, volunteering, doing it for a job, whichever. I mean, that's really where you're mm -hmm. going to hone your skills as a coach is real life work. Yeah, and then reflecting on that practice theory in isolation just becomes armchair coaching. And I, I see a lot of uh, theory not being applied and to form as a coach, it takes to go out there, have those conversations, you know, reflect on what just happened. Um, ideally in supervision, I think when we work with psychedelics, I think it's essential to have somebody who's a professional at helping you reflect on these kind of things. Um, I want to take you back for a moment to those personal experiences that are important when we work with people. Um, I think probably every coach who's particularly specialized in addiction recovery had their own journey of addiction in the past. Um, most coaches in, I meet in the psychedelic realm say it's essential that you have your own psychedelic journey and not just, you know, had an experience and now I'm helping people with this, but substantial, um, you know, have gone quite far uh, into the psychedelic realm. Um, do you think it's important that somebody's come from an addiction background or from a psychedelic background in order to help people with that? Is that one of those things that you would say are important as, as personal experience? Or can a coach who's not had any uh, challenges in that area, not had that background, can they create a space to really support somebody um, on that kind of journey? Well, there are pros and cons to having gone through the same journey that your client has gone through. And of course, a person cannot walk in the shoes of their client completely. So regardless of what the counselor client or coach client relationship is, there's always going to be some commonalities and there's always going to be some differences. So absolutely, professionals can help people without having gone through the same things that they've gone through. I mean, we we can see that and measure that. It's it's happening every day. But it makes sense that it would be helpful for, you know, like a certain specialized coach to be specialized in the areas that they are working in. So for instance, if someone is a psychedelic integration coach, to me, it would make sense that they have their own psychedelic experiences and that they understand what it's like to go into that psychedelic space and to see things so abstractly and so abruptly and suddenly and to have these, you know, huge insights because if a coach doesn't have those experiences, like they could misinterpret something that happened in, in the psychedelic experience, or they could overlook it. And so I think it's helpful when possible, when a therapist or a coach or a professional can have experiences, but certainly you're not going to be like, hmm, I think I'll go get addicted to heroin, or, you know, I think I'll go give myself chronic pain so I can understand what this client's going through. I mean, sometimes it's not possible. In the case of psychedelics, it's possible people can go out and have these experiences so long as it fits their spiritual path. I mean, psychedelics aren't for everyone and it doesn't fit in everybody's, you know, desires, but you're probably not going to be a psychedelic integration coach if it doesn't. So on the one hand, Yannick, I would say that it makes sense for people to have experiences and can relate to the niche market that they're in and to the clientele that they're working with. On the other hand, it's not possible to go out and have every experience that your client's going to have. So certainly possible, yeah. coaches can work with people without these experiences. Um, I think that the advantage is that you can relate to them and you can understand, but the disadvantage is that you might bring in your own personal experience into the mix. And I would say we struggle more on that end. So like our coaches that have done a ton of ayahuasca and all the psychedelics, it's like when they're working with clients, they have a really hard time just setting their stuff aside. So we have to kind of keep yeah. reminding them that's your journey and that's different than the client's journey. And so it actually takes quite a lot of training and work on our end to bring our coaches to a place of neutrality and objectivity and non-biasness to just be really present with their clients. Mm -hmm. So in those situations, I have seen coaches that don't have as much experience actually taking psychedelic medicines be amazing coaches because they're so present in listening mm -hmm. to the client mm -hmm. that they're not interjecting their own notions and experiences into it. 
Yeah, and that's that's so difficult to learn for some people because uh, I've seen so many, particularly coaches, who want to offer their knowledge and they want to guide their clients. They want to offer their help through their own experience. This has helped me. So the assumption is that this is likely to help you too. Um, so where... Maybe ask the question in terms of at your school, when you teach coaching, to what extent is there a mentoring element to this, a sharing of knowledge? Um, or is this uh, a creative, on the other side of the spectrum, a creative dialogue that where we facilitate our clients' insights um, through holding that space for them to ask themselves questions rather than guide them through a particular journey? So you're saying like what's like the 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 mentoring and the guidance of a coach who's helping a client through these experiences? Yeah, we're on that spectrum between this is a space that I'm holding for you to reflect and ask questions and it's completely client led to on the other end of that spectrum being I'm the kind of coach that shows you how it's done. I'll take you by the hand and I'll show you the light. Well, I mean, first off in the training, you know, we're going to teach the coaches to be the, you know, higher conscience for the client. And so the client is going to direct their own experience. The client is going to determine what they want to work on. The client is going to bring the material into the coaching session. And then the coach is actually listening to all of that and holding a space for everything that's coming out because the client will forget, you know, they're here, then they're here, then they're here. They're all over the place with what they're saying. They kind of lose track of what they want to talk about. And so the coach is like, has a, is a container to hold everything that they're saying to help them make sense of all of it, to see the bigger picture, to see the smaller points, to work through each of the points and to make connections within that. So, you know, we are generally teaching the clients the coaches to let the client lead the session. The coach is literally almost like a guardian angel or like this, this conscience, I guess, that sits with the client only bringing back into their awareness things that they've already shared, things that were already important to them and things that they already wanted to work on. That being said, though, sometimes clients want direction and they want to know what you think and they want your experiences. And that is what separates coaching from therapy a bit too, is that coaches can disclose certain things about themselves. They can share times when they have faced a similar thing and how they worked through it and provide a little bit of direction. So there are situations where coaches within the scope of their own expertise could give a little bit of guidance and could say, you know, this or that. Like for me, if I'm talking to someone who's looking into Ibogaine, I know a tremendous amount about preparing for Ibogaine, both from a medical and from a spiritual perspective. And so if a client is telling me that they're going to do something that's dangerous, you know, I feel uh, it's within my scope to say, hey, you know, just so you know, in working with, you know, clinics around the world, I think it's important that you actually call your provider and ask them these specific questions, because what I'm hearing, this this would not be safe or this would not be good. And so somebody mm -hmm. else that doesn't have that experience is probably not going to be able to share as much. So there are times when, you know, a coach can share particular opinions, but they need to mention it as such. So the coach would say, look, in my experience or to my understanding or based on this, you know, article, scientific article that I read recently or in this training that I went to. So what you're doing is you are clarifying with the client where the information comes from. Mm -hmm. The information is being added into the conversation coming from outside of their own um, mind. And then it's fine because you've disclosed that information. So hmm. does that answer your question? Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. And I think it points to the importance of one, the contracting stage in which you uh, tell a client from what kind of perspective you're coming and what can you do for them and what can't you do for them. Uh, and when you share something like that, to disclose where that information is, you're just putting a piece of information on the table and say, here's a piece of information. What do you think about that? You're not saying this is the truth and you need to be doing that. So I really like the how you phrase these things um, to to highlight and encourage the client to take responsibility for their for their actions. 
Yeah, I think it's important because, you know, I would say a concern in the coaching arena is that coaches are coming in and positioning their own worldview as the absolute truth. And they are sharing recommendations and they are sharing spiritual information and teachings and their own insights from psychedelic experiences as truth and they're positioning it as truth. And we must be careful because I've learned that the in the helping relationship, the coach or the counselor has a lot of influence over the client. And it's actually concerned me before how much clients will take what you say mm-hmm. as gold. I'm yeah. like, Whoa. no matter how careful you are phrasing it, careful. they will take it. They, they love you. They trust you. you. You're, you're putting more love and more belief into them than anyone has in a long time. So whatever you say, they will really hang on to it. Mm-hmm. And so I think it's really important that coaches are not introduced projecting their own notions about cosmic wisdom or what have you into the into the coaching conversation because then it's not neutral and it's not coaching anymore then we're getting into like teaching or mentoring or we're getting into a a different sphere so it takes a lot of self-awareness and i think a lot of training for most people to become like to to um, notice when we are doing that because sometimes it's obvious I have an experience and I just want to share it and guide somebody, but often it's very subtle. It's often unconscious. And I've seen coaches um, in observed sessions, just not, I don't think they're quite aware how they're influencing a client, which adds kind of to the sensitivity of this and the delicateness. And I really like that you're encouraging coaches to be aware of what their own biases are and to try their best to not bring that into the coaching space. Hey, I'm I'm looking at the time and I don't want to take as much time on your birthday. Also, um, we said we're going to aim for, for 75, 90 minutes. Um, I have a couple of sort of quick fire questions that we usually ask uh, people at the end of these conversations. Um, I've got a lot more questions we could ask. Maybe we can do that in another episode at some point. But for now, I want to respect your time. And uh, here's a couple of questions that you can answer in as much or as little time as you would like. Uh, they're about six of them. So just so you have an idea, usually it takes about, you know, 10, 15 minutes to get through them. Um, yeah, and just, no, I'm in, I'm in no hurry. So just go for it. Oh, fantastic. So you can, you can take your time answering them if you want to. Um, any words of warning for a coach who's starting out in this area? Something that uh, you think would be really helpful for coaches to be aware of entering this field? Okay. Um, yeah, I, I think that there's quite a few things that you could cover in this regard. Um, you know, s- starting with maybe some some advice and then I can get to some, you know, areas of caution, I suppose. The one thing I will say about coaching is that it's a very highly active career. It's not a, you know, sit on my butt and wait for business to come to me. To be a coach, you really have to be an outgoing person, highly driven, highly motivated. You can do very well in the coaching sector. It's fun. It's fulfilling. It's profitable. It's rewarding beyond belief. It keeps you on your toes. Like you're always learning and growing. You're forced to do the work yourself because if you don't, you know, your own clients will call you out. And so it's, it's such an amazing profession, but it's different than becoming a medical professional, you know, where you get a job and you go into some kind of government arena and the work comes to you. It, with coaching, you have to know business. You have to understand how to bring in clients. And that's only half of it is actually bringing in the clients. After that, it's it's keeping the clients. So, um, I feel very inspired with training coaches in this arena, but that's one thing that sometimes I notice is this entitlement of like, I went through the training, now I'm ready to just be handed everything. And it's not like that in this career. You really have to put the pedal to the metal in terms of what it takes to build a coaching practice. Um, you can be a freelance coach and work for companies like Being True to You, and there's a bunch of other companies now building coaching platforms. And so you can do that, but still, you know, there's there's only so many clients that might be coming in. So you're probably still going to want to go out and stir up more business. So you just need to know that that it's a highly driven um, 
profession. I would say it's good to find a niche, as I said before, and specialize in an area and then become the best coach in that arena. So whatever that is, whether it's a certain population that you're targeting or a certain condition or a certain tool, transformational tool that you're working with, it does help to specialize in a particular niche. And then it also helps to find a product and service what they would call a minimal viable product and to perfect that first. So before you try to create, you know, a big business and branch out in all these different areas, it's good to just find one thing and become the best at that. And that's really the the path to success is you have your niche, you have your specialization, and then you have the one thing that you do. Maybe it's a six session program with a workbook that you do and you just get so good at that before you expand into other things. Um It's important to understand that your success is really dependent on your character. It doesn't matter how many credentials you have, although that can be helpful and all the practice and communicating is really helpful. But what ultimately determines your success as a coach is your character. If you have a chip on your shoulder, if you have any defensiveness, if you have any judgment, if you have any agenda whatsoever, your client is going to sniff that out immediately and they will just quit. I mean, we see it all the time with our new coaches, you know, they they try to hide aspects about themselves and the coach will call and say, oh, they're this or they're that. I don't want to work with them. And I'll talk to the coach and they're like, I didn't say anything like that. There's no way they could have known. I'm like, they could sense it. Mm -hmm. And so you, you really do have to work on that ability to relate to clients. Also, make it count with every client. Don't next your client. Like we live in this culture of just like nexting people like, oh, that client didn't work. Bring on the next one. It doesn't work that way. You actually have to give it your all with every client, whether you like them or not. (laughs) Hopefully you do. But it's like you want you don't want to think like, oh, they didn't do the work. They can't pay next. You really have to put your heart and soul into each person that you're working with because that is what's going to drive more people to you. The universe is not going to keep bringing you people if you're if you're falling short on integrity, you're showing up late for sessions, you got noise in the background, you're not taking the time to prepare, you're not listening well, you can't just keep going and getting that next client. You really need to make it count from with every client. And it's important to also do things right from the beginning. You know, take the time to set things up right and do right by people. You should never let somebody walk out your door upset ever. I mean, there, you shouldn't have enemies out there. You shouldn't have all these grievances. If you have a list of grievances, you're not doing well as a coach. You should get along with everyone. That includes the professionals. That includes the, the people in the media, such as yourself. That impl- includes um, partners. It doesn't mean that you're going to like everyone or they're going to like you, but you can get along with them. And that's part mm-hmm. of running a successful business is you have to have integrity and do right by people because Every decision you make, you will have to answer for that at some point. And Mm -hmm. it can take a long time to build a reputation, but it takes just a very short amount of time to lose that reputation. So I would also say be selective in what you include in your coaching practice. I wouldn't include things that are not coaching. And if you are going to include something that's not coaching, then you need to sell it that way. I provide coaching and energy healing. But don't hide the energy healing under coaching because that's different. It's two different services that you're offering. So if you're going to bring in astrology or tarot cards or something else, then you need to say, I'm offering coaching and astrology. You need to say that up front and not say sell coaching services and then your client signs up and you're like, okay, I'm going to do an astrological reading for you. And they say, no, that's that's against my religion. I don't, I don't want to to look, I don't want to do fortune telling and, and look into the future. Yes. And think that's coaching. Or they say yes. And they think that's coaching. Exactly. So we see a lot of uh, mixed up energy in that realm. Mm -hmm. And so we just do coaching. We don't combine and mix things. And if a coach does bring something in, it needs to be disclosed up front. So that way, when someone's picking a coach, they could say, yes, that's exactly what I want. I want to work with an astrologist and I want to work with a coach and it's perfect for them. And they know going into it, it's two different things being sold together. So I would say that's important. And then, you know, 
I would just speak on the neutrality piece because we live in such a polarized world and almost every topic is now controversial and sensitive. I think that it's best that coaches come into the sphere very neutral, which means letting go of any agendas you have to re-educate people, to reprogram people. Mm. The biggest concern and risk that I see in the psychedelic community today is using psychedelic therapies as a platform to influence how people perceive life and, and how they see things. It's it's really trying to re-educate people. And I think mm. that is highly unethical and also known as mind control when you are using psychedelics. You mm. know, when people say, oh, we just need to give all the politicians psychedelics and wake them up. It's like, well, who determines what waking up means? Yeah. And there's agendas within the whole psychedelic industry that I hear people talking about where they say, you know, we're going to use psychedelics to make the brain malleable so that we can change the way people think and change their beliefs. And I think it's absolutely unethical because we shouldn't be changing people at all. We should actually be helping people return to their true self and return to their roots or let them decide for themselves, you know, what that process is. Like in the process of personal evolution, these things hop happen automatically. We really shouldn't be interjecting an agenda yeah. to use psychedelics as a platform for advocacy, for social justice, for political motives. Like none of this stuff should be crossed over into the coaching mm -hmm. arena. So I think it's important that coaches are able to look at those agendas. We all have them like we all do, right? Like I want to bring yeah. people to God. Yeah. That's my that's my my bias. You know, I want to help people find their creator. I want to help people find the path of their true self. So I say that I'm open about that. I am here to help people find the path of their true self. I'm just very clear on what my mission is. And um and, and it's okay. Like if someone wanted to be a Christian coach, you can be a Christian coach, clarify that. If you want to be a Buddhist coach and that's where your teachings come from, clarify that. Like tell people up front if you have a particular worldview that you can't separate from then then share that and to me that would be you know more neutral because and then i'll just say as a tip on the neutrality piece understand that there are different paradigms that the psychedelic worldview does not always fit all the traditional paradigms around the world so i've been very interested in worldview for a long time and i see those traditional more orthodox religious faiths and ancient cultivation practices and then there's modern ways of thinking they're not the same they actually mm -hmm. directly oppose each other mm -hmm. but there's a lot of times where books and authors and thought leaders are merging them saying it's all the same it's not the same they're different and so if you're working with people of a more traditional pathway but you're inciting uh, modern ways of thinking into the coaching relationship, you're actually putting them in conflict because they're like, oh, I like my coach. I like the psychedelic retreats, but I like my faith. And my faith is now being jeopardized because the two worlds aren't colliding. And to me, if you're a really good, ethical, neutral coach, the client wouldn't even know your beliefs. You would be helping them to develop their faith, not mm -hmm. watering down their faith with other ways of thinking. So that would be, you know, sort of my caution to people. And what I'm seeing is most relevant in today's modern world with psychedelic therapies is that tendency to want to use psychedelics to re-educate people, yeah. which, is, which is Marxism and it's not good. Yeah. I mean, often with the best intentions, right? Um, just it's not helpful. Yeah. As you say, it's often putting people in conflict and we can't claim that our way of seeing the world is the right way of seeing the world. And, you know, every way of seeing the world is going to cause issues in some way or another. So I think this is what I see in supervision all the time that coaches really struggle and you know, often unconsciously with the best intentions, wanting to change somebody's mind. And it can be really difficult to resist that and really allow this person to forge their own path and create their own philosophy and their own worldview and allow that to happen. It's now, I just recently became a parent. My, my daughter is three weeks old. And so I'm thinking about that a lot now because you have to get out of our kid's way in order to let them develop. Uh, and it can be really difficult not wanting to guide them because you feel you know it better because you've been around the block a little bit longer. Mm -hmm. 
Exactly. Yeah, like the family system that's really threatened right now. You know, people believe in marriage and family and they'll come to psychedelics because they're having marital discord. And then if you have a coach saying, oh, it's good to explore your sexuality and open your relationship and bring other people into the relationship. Mm-hmm. Very confusing for somebody who believes mm-hmm. and values marriage and family to now being told that, wait, I should yeah. I should actually lean into this and open my marriage yeah. up. And I've seen it happen where people come back in sheer spiritual crisis because mm-hmm. they gave into these things that really weren't at the core of their value system. And so, yeah. I, I think it's just hugely important that we ask the client, what's important for you? What are your core values? What would you like to see happen here? What would... What would it look like if things were improved for you mm. and they share what they want and then you help them work in that direction yeah. being true to you i see what you did there mm-hmm. <laughs> um right um right that was a very long quick fire question but i really appreciate all the words of warning and advice so thank you very much for that um this one could be a longer one could also be a pretty short one um what or who are some of the books or people that had an impact on your work um could just name a few books name a few people you could say a few words around them whatever you like I think I can answer this pretty shortly. I mean, in general, our rule of thumb is not to give recommendations. And it's kind of along the same lines because I have a separate journey than you have, than the next person has. And if I am sharing book recommendations that reflected my journey, it might actually influence or impact someone else's journey. So at being true to you, we don't share recommendations, believe it or not. We don't share book recommendations. And, you know, amongst coaches and like behind the scenes, of course, like we can share these things like, hey, have you seen this or that? Or this amazing podcast came out. I think that's important. But when it comes to clients and when it comes to speaking publicly, I actually don't share recommendations. And the reason is, is that people take what's in print too seriously. It's like because something is published or an author is up on stage saying something, people are just taking this as absolute truth. And from what I've seen, it's not always true. These are these are ideas, these are concepts, these are narratives, and these are sometimes more th- grounded theories, but still there's a psychic warfare going on right now, essentially. And I think it's really important that people learn how to do their own due diligence in finding resources that they can trust. I would just say when I'm looking at resources and books, I'm personally looking for leaders and thought leaders who have a moral compass, who have strength of character, who have integrity, who have discernment, who are speaking about things that I think you know, really matter to our human experience and to the collective more than supportive of maybe just like one population, but people that can see like the bigger picture of all of humanity. So these are the kinds of things that I'm looking for. Um, and, and, you know, and I tend to value two people that will speak to the, the narrow path of cultivation. So there's like two different ways of thinking, right? There's the thought of, I need to evolve and change and become a different person. And the thinking of, I want to return to my roots and my tradition and discover my original essence. And so those two schools of thought are conflicting in a lot of the books today where, you know, I kind of think you're returning to your original essence. You're dissolving and transforming all of the the false falsity and and the dark particles that are clouding who we truly are inside. And so I'm looking, you know, at authors that are speaking to that and that narrow path of cultivation that's a little bit more strict and a little bit more orthodox. Whereas a lot of the books today are very much about, you know, take everything that speaks to you, get a little bit of truth from everything and evolve yourself into a new different person. So when you get into books, there's too much suggestive material that's in it that people just really take and hang on for a lifetime. And so I personally don't want to be responsible for those those books. You know, I would just say each person needs to do their own due diligence on where they're at and what yeah. what is calling to them. So there how do you what do you do in your course then? I assume then there isn't a reading list. Are there any 
pointers or other materials that you invite people to engage with to then discuss? Nope. Not wow. crazy. I know. <laughs> yeah, that's Not crazy. crazy. <laughs> I have one book right here. So there's three books. This is part one. So there's three books this size. It's 800 pages total. And so this is part one. And then there's, there's two other books. I don't have them by me. And no, the whole thing is very logistical and it's very universal. Um, never once in 10, in eight years has somebody challenged the material because the way that we wrote it was just so inarguable, just so universal to really fit everyone and just very logistical and really listening to people directly about what works, what doesn't, what they need, what they don't need. And then building a training program on our own experiences, helping people directly. So although we do quote people in the, you know, addiction industry and in the psychedelic industry, you know, we will quote people and, and certain thought leaders and really just to show perspective and the spectrum of different ways to, to look at these things. But no, we don't have a reading list and we don't, and we don't, um, for the, the book that you just showed us, because that is a reading list in a way that somebody's written and tried to argue a certain cases or offer questions. Yeah, I mean, I wrote the whole book, all 800 pages. And um, with the help of Dr. Dan Engel comes in for the third part. And so we wrote that based on our experiences. And like I said, you know, we'll quote some people, but really what we want to teach coaches is to create a model resonant of themselves and resonant of the work that they're doing and not to just piece together other people's work, but to actually yeah. figure out what is, you know, a model that best fits you as a coach and best fits your clientele. And, and we provide the, the basis and the foundation for that. But yeah, we're not turning people to a bunch of different sources, believe it or not. We're really turning people inward to make those decisions for themselves. Okay. Wow. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, I've asked a question around coaching and therapy, and I think you answered it really well already where you see the differences and how you might formulate that. Um, let me ask you about regulation. I have a sense that I might know how your stance on it, but like when you think about regulation, is that, is it needed? Is it in the way? Is it inevitable that it's going to come? Is it restricting the good work of coaches? Yeah, I mean, okay, really important question. I'll try to answer quickly. I mean, I personally support coaching as an unregulated practice of helping others. And this is just because I think that not every profession has to go through academia and government and legislature and be centralized or monopolized. Like the reason I love coaching so much is because it's not regulated. Now, I know there's advantages and disadvantages to that, mm -hmm. but coaching, much like psychedelics, it allows people to explore a greater aspect of the human experience. So we're not taking it and putting it in a box and controlling how people see things, which is exactly how these controlled professions are. It's like, here's how to see a person's psychology. Here's how to diagnose it. Here's how to treat it. And the thing is, when you take psychedelics, it like goes beyond all of that. It goes beyond the labels, beyond the standards, beyond the stereotypes, beyond the boundaries of what certain groups of people have deemed to be true. So I personally like the fact that coaching is an unregulated industry. And I think that it parallels really well with the psychedelic therapies that people are doing because it allows people to think outside the box. And it allows like one human being to sit with another human being and just be so present in that existential conversation that there are no boundaries. But I will say that I'm for standards and and guidance practices. So I do think that it can be really helpful when an organization will put out their guidance practices saying like, look, we've done this for a decade or two or three decades, and we have found some clear universal protocols that we would like to share with the world. And when other organizations can actually collect those too, like an organization says, you know, this person, this organization, this organization all have really good things. I'm going to collect them and put them on a website. So I am for guidance principles and protocols, and I'm definitely for public accountability. And, and, and that's, what's really great is that as a coach, if you are practicing poorly, 
you have poor character, you don't have integrity, you're doing things unethically, you're not going to last. No one's going to come back to you and everyone's going to spread the word and everyone's going to say this person's doing that. I mean, you'll just be outed. It's the same thing in the psychedelic facilitation world. If you're doing careless things, everyone's going to tell on you. And so to me, I like the fact that we're creating an industry that's self-governed and that is publicly governed. I mean, people can put testimonials out, they can put feedback out. And a good coach is going to look at that and say, oh my gosh, they're right. Like this is what I did was, was, was a poor decision and I have to make this right. So I'm for self-governance and I'm for public accountability. I think there's a lot of models where that works um, in, in our, in our culture. And then within a system, like within our system, we have our own supervision, we have our own peer mentoring classes, um, we have practice coaching, we have self-evaluation forms and the opportunity to have somebody else evaluate how you're coaching. And we can like collect testimonials and take those in and, and continue to learn and grow. So I definitely think it's important to do good work and to do ethical work and to put the well-being of your client first and to have solid ethics. We're huge on ethics here. We have a whole two-hour lecture just on ethics. And then we talk about that in other lectures as well. But I am in, in definite support of the unregulated industry because I see what happens when these industries get regulated and they get controlled and they get monopolized and centralized. And to it, it, it takes away a certain essence in this work. So that's where I stand. I hear you. Thank you for that. Um, you mentioned there's more and more coaching agencies, directories. Uh, do you notice any other uh, notable trends uh, that are going on in the coaching or psychedelics field? Um, you know, I just think in general, I think in general, you know, people are more interested in doing the work. I think people are less likely to look for quick fixes. I think people like want to engage in genuine services. You know, there's still that tendency to like want to buy your way out of things and to find something that can help. And I, I think it's always going to be that way. But, you know, I do think that people are seeking out alternative ways. People are looking at holistic ways of healing. People want to do the work. I think that's why people love psychedelic therapies and why psychedelic therapies are getting the attention that they're getting right now. And it's because people can go in, suffer a little bit. I think people understand that you do have to like no pain, no gain, you know? And, and I, I think that, that, that there's that need to, to struggle and to face things directly and to do the work. And so that's a big trend. And I think that that's why coaching and psychedelics are going to be on the rise because both of these things really support that. Um, and just catalysts for change in general. We see a lot of transformational tools coming on board. It's not that they're new. It's just that these things like go through trends, you know, like saunas and cold plunges and things like this. And then there's technologies, maybe like some biofeedback technologies that are coming in. And it's because, you know, people are looking to catalyze change. Like they're looking for a way to catapult and to, to grow and evolve, you know, faster. And so I think these things are sort of trending, um, understanding nutrition and supplementation and detoxification, I think is a trend, which is amazing, like to really understand how to cleanse and detox the body and really looking at what we use food for in our culture, I think is a really good trend that we have. In the future, I think people will just be altogether more educated and more selective of what they choose. I don't think in the future people will believe things just because their doctor said or their counselor said or this author or this scientist said. I think people will learn how to discern what's good for them, for themselves, and they'll become much more particular about who they work with and, and what they work with. And, you know, that's kind of why I don't necessarily like everything to be regulated either because once it's regulated then people just trust it it's like oh my doctor said this so it's true and therefore i'm going to do it or science said this and so it's true and so i'm going to do it and what it does is it takes away a person's ability to just discern for themselves and actually look at the information and say you know do i need to be on pain pills the rest of my life i don't think so i think that there's other ways that i could actually go about this so i think that that's the trend that we'll see in the future is is people owning their healing journeys and being more protective of what they bring into their sphere. And 
understanding that there is no quick fix. There really isn't. There's no external solution to suffering. There just isn't. Like, yeah, there are factors and variables that can be shifted and moved around and we can create a more loving and wholesome society, of course, but like ultimately you have to, to cultivate. So I think in the future, that's what people will learn is their own inter cultivation from a spiritual perspective and from an interpersonal perspective. And again, both the field of coaching and psychedelic therapies are supportive of, of all of these trends. So I think that we're just in a great space here. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for that. Wow. Uh, I could comment on so many things. This is, uh, that's fantastic. I'll just say thank you at this point. Um, what else we talked about when we might need to stop working with a client. Um, maybe could you tell us about a, a particularly memorable client uh, that you've worked with in the past? I know there'll be many, many, many clients, but uh, does somebody come to mind where that that kind of there was a special experience for you as a coach? Um, yeah, okay. I'll speak to one gentleman that I worked with um, early on. This was a gentleman who had burned all of his bridges. He had been addicted to opiates and then Suboxone for about 12 years. Um, somehow he made his way to Ibogaine. I believe he sold his pickup truck to get there, which definitely shows a dedication. Wow. But um, his family wouldn't pay for coaching and um, because they they just didn't believe in him anymore. And, and he had nothing, like no job, no money, no friends, like family kind of wouldn't talk to him, but yet he was still dependent on them. And, you know, when I talked to him, he was so motivated to coach with me, like more than anything, he wanted to coach with me. And I knew that he sold his truck just to get to Ibogaine. So I coached him pro bono and I ended up coaching him for six months regularly. He never missed a session in every single week he was there and everything we talked about, he followed through on like literally like every assignment, every conversation he played full out. He never used after Ibogaine. He never went back, even got off Suboxone, which is like really difficult. Even with Ibogaine, it's hard to get off Suboxone. And he, he got off opiates, he got off Suboxone, he got off coffee, he got off TV, he got off pornography. And um, I stayed in touch with him for over three years I even heard from him like about a year ago as well. I know he's still doing good and he never went back to opiates. He gave up all these attachments. He played full out on coaching. And I just remember how endearing it was to work with him because he just really cherished this process, even though, you know, no one else believed in him and no one funded the coaching. I did that because I was building, you know, my own experience. So, that was really memorable. And there was a lot of cases like that, to be honest, of people completely turning their life around with the help of coaching and psychedelic therapies, but he put in the work and that's why it was so memorable. Like he did not take any of it for granted. I mean, he just went the whole nine yards with it and it paid off. He got a job, he got a girlfriend, like everything. He got his own house, like everything that you could want in your recovery is what he did. Wow. Wow, how rewarding to be part of somebody's journey like that. Mm -hmm. And thank you. Thank you for opening that space. Uh, it's not a given that people work pro bono and uh, especially with a client like that. Thank you. Um, mm -hmm. Right. Last real big question, maybe. Um, if you could take over the screen uh, of a person or a group of people and have their undivided attention, um, so could be the whole world if everybody had a screen, you know, um, just if you could have a person's attention, a group of people's attention or the whole world's attention for a minute, what would you tell them? Um, okay. I mean, I would have to go back to something that I kind of said before, because I think it's just so relevant and it's really on my mind today. I would speak directly to the psychedelic community, psychedelic facilitators, psychedelic advocates, and psychedelic stakeholders. And I would say, do not use psychedelics to re-educate and mold the minds of people. I mean, really, that is mind control. I think that psychedelics are so precious because they are neutral. Many times people ask me, like, are psychedelics God work or are they the devil's work? You know, and you have to think about things when you're doing this work. Like, you really have to think about it. Is this helping our culture? Is it not? And I continue to come back to the realization <clears throat> that psychedelic substances and plant medicines and entheogens, 
they're neutral and they can be used for good or bad. And I think that that's what's so precious about them. And I think that's why people are trusting in these plant teachers and in these entheogenic experiences because they can go in and receive that compassion, that non-judgment, that tolerance, no matter who they are, what where what path they've walked, what they've done in their lives. It's like those medicines are going to love them and help them um, develop and grow from there. That's never the problem. The problem is the people around it that are coming in with these agendas to shape and control the minds of people and the consciousness around this. And like you said, like they're good intentions. We all want to see the world move to a better place, but we have to be particularly careful that we um are neutral with these experiences because it's true the brain is very malleable under these experiences and you can easily plant seeds into people's minds and i don't think that we should be doing that i think we really need to use discernment around that i hear people um making very you know direct claims about god about cosmic wisdom about christ about buddha about you know just the spiritual path in general and these things are being positioned as truth and they're also opposing you know some of the original doctrines that come from you know these spiritual teachers and so i think personally we should not be control controlling the trajectory of people's consciousness and mind or spiritual pathways i think that we should maintain that neutral objective non-biased container around people to the best of our ability and we can disclose when we can't be neutral it's okay it's okay to come in and say look i am a christian or i am you know spiritual or i am an atheist or i'm an academic it's okay like to be who we are and it's okay to show yourself as a coach and be honest about those things but from that position i think we need to be really careful because i'm i'm seeing and i'm hearing a lot of comments about how psychedelics can be used to um change people's belief systems and control consciousness and personally i think that we should be promoting free thinking we should be helping people to well we should be respecting people's traditions and faith and belief systems not trying to tear them down so that's that's what i would share if i could if i could take over the screen of um the psychedelic community that's what i would say because that ultimately is going to give us so much virtue in this work we will have a lot of virtue if we can maintain these sort of simple principles and hold that space for people and i will tell you this is the sole reason why i am staying in the psychedelic arena because i think that the arena does need a very neutral coaching company and that we can continue to train coaches in this regard which is going to protect this movement and and ensure that we can help as many people as we can through this movement we're just not dictating what it means to awaken what it means to change what it means to evolve what it means to grow that is something that only the client can determine for themselves mm. great thank you so much um Where can people find you and your work? You mentioned the uh, Being True to You website. Um, if people wanted to enter your sphere or your organization's sphere, uh, where do they go? Um, beingtruetoyou.com is the best place to find us. You can find us on Facebook. You can find us on Instagram. But um, you can just go right to our website at beingtruetoyou.com. Fantastic. Bien. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you taking the time on a special day. Uh, really enjoyed the conversation and thank you for the work that you're doing and what you're putting out there, uh, especially around the responsibility we're taking and um, you know the encouragement to allow people choosing their own path and allowing coaches to choose their own path and how they engage in the work. Uh, I really appreciated that. So thank you very much. Thank you, Yannick. Thank you so much um, for having me on. Such a pleasure.